A while ago, I was reading this memoir by Dolly Alderton at the advice of my wife, uh, Rachel, Everything I Know About Love, and there was a moment in it that really struck me. Uh, I'll do the sort of radio edit clean version. Um, She said, Hannah, my friend, on the night of her 30th birthday, asked, is this it? Is this all life is? Effing Tottenham Court Road and ordering rubbish off Amazon? I was 21 when I witnessed that meltdown and found it utterly baffling. She told me I would understand when I was 30. I did. I do. I think most of us, most of the time, probably aren't really asking ourselves what our purpose in life is or whether it has any meaning. But I think that for all of us, at one point or other, we will find ourselves asking that kind of question. Is this it? Is this all life is? What does it mean? What is it for? And I'm not going to try and tell you, I know there's a whole range of different worldviews in the room tonight, I'm not going to try and tell you that if you don't believe in God, that means somehow your life is meaningless. Not at all. I think the things on uh, the cards that we've just been discussing, they are hugely meaningful. Loving other people enjoying the the beautiful, precious things that this world uh, affords us, making a difference, trying to to make uh, the world a better place. I think those things are massively meaningful. All I want to do is ask, firstly, why do you think those things do matter? Why do you think they are meaningful? And if you don't know why they matter, will that sense of purpose last? Or will there come a day whether it's a quarter-life crisis or a midlife crisis or a deathbed crisis, where you find yourself kind of staring down the fact that death is going to take every page of the story that you've carefully written with your life and burn it until, as Ethan said, no one can even remember. Will a moment come suddenly where it all feels like, hang on, what was the point? And I want to share tonight what I have found in Jesus and what many of the people in this room have found in Jesus, which is that he provides both a real explanation for why these things feel meaningful and a solid foundation for our own sense of purpose that's actually based on reality and so it will not crumble even in the face of death itself. So let me catch you up on the story so far if you've just joined us this evening and you haven't been here the last couple of weeks. Jesus grew up in obscurity in uh, first century Palestine, and then he began to travel around the countryside uh, displaying incredible power, healing people, and also giving amazing teaching. To this day, even atheists consider his moral teaching to be incredibly profound, deeply beautiful, and to have shaped and transformed the world over the last 2,000 years in a really positive way. But mixed in with that wise teaching, he's also claiming to be God. He's saying that he can forgive people's sins. He's saying that he's existed for thousands of years before he was born. He's saying that one day he's going to come back and be the judge of everyone who's ever lived. At one point, he basically says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. And the religious authorities hate that. And they manage eventually to get him arrested and then condemned to death on jumped-up charges. And Jesus, in spite of his incredible power and his huge popularity, he doesn't try to escape. He doesn't even defend himself on trial. It's like he's walking towards brutal torture and execution on purpose. And so it all happens. His male followers all flee and abandon him in fear and despair And he dies with the promise of forgiveness on his lips. And if the story ended there, I think it would be one of the great kind of unsolved mysteries of human history, wouldn't it? Who was this guy? How could he have been so morally wise and insightful, but then at the same time have been sufficiently unwell to have delusions that he was the God of the universe? And why did he let himself get killed like that? But... All of the primary sources, the historical sources, they tell us that that isn't the end of the story. Uh, A group of his women followers who had seen him killed and had seen where he was buried, early on the Sunday morning, they set off to go to the tomb with spices to anoint the body as was traditional. But when they get to the tomb, 
the big stone in the, over the entrance of the tomb has been rolled away, and he isn't in there. The, the linen uh, that would have been wrapped around the body is still there, but it's empty. The, the corpse has gone. And then a divine messenger appears and tells them, you won't find Jesus here. He is risen. He is alive. And they rush back to the male disciples and they tell them everything. But the men dismiss the women's testimony completely. They think it's all nonsense. But then they start seeing Jesus. First the women and then the men as well. Lots of them, on multiple different occasions as individuals and in groups, over a period of six weeks, they meet Jesus. And we're going to zoom in uh, on just one of those meetings. Uh, It's on page 79 of the little books that say Luke on them in front of you. I've left mine on my table, so I'm going to get it now. Thank you. Um, So this is Luke's account of Jesus' life. Based on his investigation of the eyewitnesses, you can look at his sort of method of research on page one later if you like. But we're going to just look at page 79, and I want to just suggest four huge things, four wonderful implications that this has for us and for our sense of purpose, if it's actually true. And then we're going to take some time to look at the evidence and think about whether it really is true. So... Let's uh, start from the little number 36 in the middle of the page. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So they are, they're baffled, they're scared, they don't believe it. And I think that's very understandable. Dead people stay dead. They knew that, we knew that, we know that. I think we'd probably feel very similar if we were in their situation. So Jesus sets out to to prove to them that this is real, it's really happening. And the first thing he emphasizes is, it's really me. He says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Why his hands and his feet? Because they still have the wounds in them from the nails that nailed him to the cross to die. So here are the first two wonderful things that this shows us. Firstly, if this is true, there really is a God. Because Jesus claimed to be God and now he rises from the dead to prove it. If Jesus really rose from the dead... And it settles the the great kind of question of where this world came from in the first place, of whether there's more to it than just atoms bouncing around. There is a God, and he's introduced himself to us in Jesus. And of course, if that's true, and he really is God become a human, it makes total sense that death couldn't hold him. It's not at all surprising that he would be able to rise from the dead. But it's even better than that. There is a God, and that God really cares. You know, this is God in human form saying, it's me, you can tell by the wounds. Imagine being one of those men, those disciples, who had fled and abandoned Jesus in his hour of kind of suffering and trial, and then seeing him stand there in front of you with his arms outstretched, with the nail marks in his hands saying, peace be with you. That's how much God loves us. He was willing to suffer with us and die for us so that he could forgive us for all of our failures and he could rescue us from death. That is how much God cares. And that explains our feelings about love and caring for others, doesn't it? That why does loving loving people and caring for people feel so meaningful, feel like it matters? Well, I think it's because we were made by a God who is love And we were made for love. We were made to love others and to love him. So that's the first and second massive things. There's a God and that God really loves us. Now let's read on and look at the third. Uh, We'll start from the little number 39 again. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe him because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. 
He said to him, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So here he's proving to them, it's really me and I'm really alive. I'm not just a vision. I'm not just a ghost. You can touch me. Come on, touch me. And I love that he then goes, actually, come on, have you got anything to eat? Look, I will literally, I'll eat a fish. A hallucination cannot make a fish disappear into its stomach. So the third huge, wonderful reality that Jesus shows us here is that death is not the end. What we do now has meaning, not just because there's a God who cares about us, but because death doesn't actually burn everything into ashes in the end. Jesus went through death and out the other side. And that proves that it is not just, well, when you die, that's it, your worm food. So I think that that changes how we think about the other card, the card about uh, enjoying, pursuing happiness in this life. Because when we think of all the beauty and joy that we taste in this world, actually we can be sure it's not just a kind of fleeting accident that we have to snatch as much as we can while we get the chance. No, the beauty and joy in this world are a gift from a loving God and they are meant to be like an appetizer. We are, they are meant to be just the beginning Because we were made to enjoy beauty and discovery, laughter and love forever with God. And Jesus has gone through death and out the other side so that he can take this whole physical, beautiful world with him and so that he can take us through with him if we'll let him. And then the fourth thing, we don't have time to read it all now, but Jesus goes on here to give his disciples a job to do in the present. Christianity doesn't kind of drain meaning out of life now by saying that there's life beyond death. Actually, that future fills the present with lasting significance. There's a verse in the Bible that I really love. Um, It's in one of the early letters written by one of the first followers of Jesus. And he's just done this whole big chapter about how Jesus literally rose from the dead. And that means he can raise us from the dead too. And then he lands on this. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not pointless. It's not all going to come to nothing and be burnt into ashes in the end. So Jesus rising from the dead wasn't so much just kind of Jesus' second birthday, It's actually much more like a second big bang. It's the explosion into this world of a new, healed, renewed, everlasting new world. And Jesus basically says to us, he doesn't just say, I want you to be part of my family. He says, I want you to be part of my family business. And he is planting seeds now for this new world that he's creating. And he says, come and plant seeds of love and justice and truth with me you know, in, in our work lives, in our family lives, in our relationships, in our academic life, our, um, our prayers, in all sorts of ways. And he says, I will take those seeds and I will uh, make them grow into something that lasts forever. And I find that absolutely exhilarating. I find it incredibly energizing and exciting to know that we actually have a purpose right now that matters forever. And it's not just a sort of sense of purpose, it's, it's real purpose based on reality, based on the reality of what Jesus has done by rising from the dead and the promise of what he will do when he comes back. So that is just a little snapshot of what it means if Jesus really rose from the dead. But the question that that should raise for us is, did he? Did he actually rise from the dead? Because if this isn't literally true, then the Bible itself says that Christianity is a waste of time and it's a a pack of lies. So I want to say we're really not encouraging anyone here to have kind of a leap of blind faith, to just believe this for no reason. Let me share with you a quote from the, um, uh, the Oxford professor, John Lennox, that I find really helpful. He says, faith is not a leap in the dark. It's the exact opposite. It's a commitment based on evidence. And in the Bible, faith is essentially trust. 
It's, it's trust in Jesus, and we trust someone because we have reason to trust them. So I'm just going to run through now just a, a quick kind of set of headlines of the evidence uh, that Jesus actually came back from the dead that persuaded me um, to, to trust him uh, several years ago. And then we're going to have a chance for Q&A. It's a bit different tonight, uh, but we, we really want you to note down any questions you have, any things that make you think, I couldn't believe that because, or I don't need to think about this because. Uh, note them down. We'll have a few minutes afterwards to put them into uh, the, a Slido thing on your phones. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and answer as many as we've got time for. Uh, because please put whatever comes to your mind. We really will not be offended. Because we actually think this is true for everybody, and so we want to thoughtfully, thoroughly engage uh, about it. So I'll just share with you four kind of basic historical facts that all serious historians of this stuff agree is just what happened, whether they're atheist or agnostic or Jewish or Christian or whatever. Um, The question is, how do we explain these facts? And that's where people disagree. So the first fact is that Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. There is tons of evidence for this. Uh, You know, there's even non-Christian historians at the time who talk about Jesus and talk about him being executed. Second fact is that that Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. The fact is we know this because if it wasn't empty, you and I would have never heard of Christianity. Because the disciples of Jesus, they were getting up in Jerusalem just after uh, Jesus had died, saying, we have seen him, he is alive, he's risen from the dead, and that means he's the king of the universe, and he's the true Lord. Caesar isn't the true Lord, Jesus is. And so both the Roman and Jewish authorities hated that because they had literally just killed Jesus, right? And all they would have needed to do, they tried very hard to quash this new thing, all they would have needed to do is go to the tomb where they had supervised this burial, and produce the corpse, and show people in Jerusalem that this was a lie, and say, well, this is so much for your king of the universe. And the thing would have died completely. It would have never got out of Jerusalem, and you and I would have never heard of Jesus of Nazareth. But we have, because they didn't do that. Because they couldn't do that, because for whatever reason, the body wasn't there. Thirdly, witnesses were convinced that they had met Jesus. This is the thing that really got me when I was looking into this. The disciples insisted they had seen him and talked to him like we've just read. And the authorities tried to silence them. They tortured them. They commanded them to stop. But history tells us that the disciples would not stop and that many of them, pretty much all of them, were either imprisoned or killed for insisting that they really had seen Jesus back from the dead. Now, of course, people die for things that aren't true all the time. But people will never die for something they know isn't true. If they had made it up themselves, when push comes to shove, they are going to put their hand up and say, okay, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me if we made it up. But we have no record of any one of them doing that. They were willing to die insisting that this was real. And fourthly, the Christian movement exploded immediately. Uh, We know this from historians like Tacitus, um, that it became a really big group, really fast, all across the Roman Empire. Uh, It was big news as soon as it happened. So the question is, how do we explain that? And there's only really been uh, a few explanations offered in the last 2,000 years. And so we can weigh them up and think, which of these is persuasive? The first explanation is that Jesus didn't really die, that he just sort of fainted on the cross and then he woke up in the tomb. And... There are a number of problems with this, the main one being that no one, we have no record of anyone ever surviving a crucifixion. The Romans were exceptionally good at killing people, it was kind of their specialist skill. And also it's really not difficult to check, is it? You can tell whether somebody is dead. Incidentally, there's also, uh, kind of accidentally, there's medical evidence in the accounts uh, that Jesus was dead. You can ask about that later if you're interested in it. The second uh, explanation is that maybe someone moved the body. But the question that raises is who? And some people have said, well, maybe it was kind of grave robbers. Uh, But actually, when you look at the sort of accounts, you realize it's very hard to imagine how that would have worked. You've got to imagine a group of grave robbers going out to the area where there's all these graves and going, right, boys, what are we going to do tonight? And Greg in the back goes, hey, do you see that one down there with the Roman guards in front of it? Should we do that one? 
And everyone goes, yeah, I love a challenge, let's do that. And so they go down, they fight the Roman guards, and they, they overcome them, and then they roll the stone away, they get in. Then they get into the tomb. And as I was saying, when the disciples describe what happened when they went, found the tomb, the, the corpse was gone, but the, the linen was still there. So you've got to imagine, they get in, they go, right, guys, what are we going to do? And Greg pipes up again and says, I've got an idea. Let's unwrap the rotting corpse from the valuable fabric. Let's leave the valuable fabric and steal the rotting corpse. And everyone goes, Greg, you're a genius. This is a good night for you. you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And the other explanation people have given is that maybe the disciples moved the body, but if they had moved the body, they would know that they were lying and they would not have been willing to die for it. And either way, neither of those things explains the appearances. Um, so the main other explanation that's been offered is that the appearances were just hallucinations. If you kind of look at the, the serious secular historians who tried to account for the evidence without saying that this really happened, they all lean heavily on the idea that uh, the appearances were group hallucinations. But there have been fewer of those accounts in the last sort of few decades because science has now shown us pretty comprehensively that group hallucinations don't happen. They're impossible. And the fourth explanation that people offer is that uh, it's just a myth that emerged over time. The problem with that is that it didn't emerge over time. We have writings uh, from the 50s, 60s, uh, 20, 30 years after the events themselves, where not only does the writer clearly believe that Jesus literally came back from the dead, but also they can assume that all of the Christians they're writing to also believe that Jesus literally came back from the dead. It's taken as read. So it's clearly incredibly early. And that's well within the window of time where the people who are claiming to be the witnesses were still alive. You could ask them. So there is literally not a scrap of evidence that suggests that there was some earlier version of Christianity that didn't have the idea that Jesus had risen from the dead. In fact, there's tons of evidence that it was at the heart of Christianity from the very, very beginning. And so if those explanations don't work, it just leaves one other explanation, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And it explains the historical facts perfectly. It explains why the tomb was empty. It explains why the disciples were so convinced that they'd met him, because they had. But it also makes sense of the wider puzzles. It, it, it solves the mystery of who this man Jesus was. It provides a really compelling solution to that. And to many more of the kind of bigger puzzles of the universe that we observe and, and human life. The explanation that Jesus rose from the dead makes perfect sense. And actually, I'd want to suggest that believing any of the other uh, ideas takes a huge leap of blind faith. But maybe you're hearing all that and you're thinking, we just can't know things about that. Or you're thinking, well, it can't be true because miracles are impossible. So however unlikely the other explanations are, they're more likely than a miracle. Uh, if that's you, whack that in the Q&A. Um, we, we'd love to talk about that. The top question, Mike, all this assumes the Bible is reliable. What if we have doubts about this? That is a fantastic question. I'm really glad somebody asked because actually the whole, in some ways, the, the fundamental thing about what I've just done with those four historical facts and the explanations is that that doesn't assume that the Bible is reliable. Um, those four facts are not things that only historians who believe that the Bible is a reliable uh, source of divine inspiration uh, agree with. Those four facts are agreed on by people who think that the Bible is a load of rubbish. Um, they're just based on what we, we know from the history and from treating the accounts we now have in the Bible as historical sources that we subject to kind of skepticism in exactly the same way as we would anything else. So the argument that I've just given is the, the argument that doesn't need any evidence that the Bible itself is a reliable source. It's just saying these are historical facts that everybody agrees on. How do we explain them? Um, I would say, though, we do have good reason to think that the gospel accounts that we find in the Bible are reliable, um, are valid historical documents. Um, and so I'd encourage you, uh, my main encouragement would be there's a book on the bookstore called Can We Trust the Gospels? 
Um, you could get that. It's, we've made it cheap for you uh, to see the kind of evidence for that. Um, but essentially, they're written very close to the time. Um, they are full of things that you wouldn't put in if you were making it up. They're full of things that are embarrassing for the, the people who are the kind of the leaders of the early church, um, things that were kind of inconvenient for them in the culture at the time. Um, they, and they are very different. There are four Gospels. They're very different in some ways, but they agree on the fundamentals consistently, and they have huge amounts of overlap. So it, they look exactly like the kind of things that would happen if one set of events had occurred and then a bunch of people who weren't all reading everyone else's work or working together, they were all trying to write an account of it, you get exactly that sort of lots of overlap, but quite a bit of difference in how they tell it in the order and what's going on here and there and so on. I should stop talking and we should do the next question. Why does something need to last forever in order to be meaningful? That's a great question. Um... That's a great question, and I don't think that it does. Um, and I think, as I've been reflecting on this topic this week, it, it's really been, been dawning on me that actually we experience lots of things in this life as meaningful. You know, basically all of the things on those cards, they feel meaningful, and as a Christian, I think that's because they are. Because I think people matter, and so society matters, and uh, relationships matter, and joy and happiness, I think that matters. I think the question is, if it was actually true that there is no God, that everything has, there is only matter bouncing around, things happening by accident over time, and that we as human beings are just pro end products of that situation, if that's true, I don't think we would expect life to feel and be meaningful in the way that it is. Uh, we, it, we might argue about it feeling meaningful, but it wouldn't be meaningful because it would all just be randomness. There is, there is no uh, kind of purpose. There is no meaning to it. Um, but I think actually our experience of meaningful things, even things that don't last, points us to the fact that this universe isn't an impersonal, accidental universe. It's made by a God who uh, imbues it with meaning. I'll stop talking again and go to the next one. I'm going to challenge you to see how short you can make the answer to this. Yeah, okay. What is the purpose of Jesus? <sighs> In Jesus, God has come to uh, meet us in our darkness, our death, our disconnection from him, and to forgive everything that's wrong in, in our lives, to restore our relationship with him, and there, thereby to restore our relationship with each other and with the whole world, not just now, but forever. I'll go with that. That was great. What difference will Jesus' resurrection make to you when you wake up tomorrow morning? Well, I mean, it's cheating to refer to what I've already said, but this is the difference that it makes to me. So, I, I really vividly remember... Uh, waking up in the middle, it was a, you know what I was saying about quarter-life crises, mid, mid-life crises, I had a mid-uni crisis, where in the second term of my second year, I, I was just exhausted, I was questioning everything, I wasn't sure about my course, I wasn't sure about my faith, I wasn't sure about my church, I, I was just a mess, and I was exhausted, and I woke up one morning, and I just, I remember the first thought that went through my head was, please don't make me, please don't make me do this day. And then the second thought that went through my head was, do you know what? If you didn't do anything today, God would be just as delighted in you as he is right now. If you let down everybody who's expecting something from you today and you just stayed curled up in this bed under this duvet, at the end of the day, God, of, the God of the universe, would be just as delighted with you as he is right now. And I remember that gave me such this burst of joy and like, energy to actually get up and want to do the day. And so knowing that there really is a God who's come and he's proved himself to us by rising from the dead, but he loved us to death, that sets me free every day to not have to earn my sense of worth or purpose or value, 
But the fact that he has risen from the dead and he has invited me into his family business means that I'm excited about what I get to do every day. Whether that is literally just making a cup of tea for someone and being kind to them, or whether it's doing something like this and getting to tell people about Jesus, or whether it's trying to make a difference politically or whatever it might be, I know that those things are not wasted because I'm doing them with Jesus, and he is making a new world, and he actually wants me to be involved in it. That was a lot longer, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just thinking, Mike, so many of these questions are really, really good, um, but none of them have particularly stood out above other ones. Just tell people, I know this is not the time we're supposed to do this, but like, what could they do to get these questions answered? Because they're all, there's stuff that we've got available for people. Oh, there? great. Okay. So you, uh, I won't read all the questions, but what you should definitely, if you've got questions that um, pe the people around you on your table aren't sure about the answers to, um, please do check out the bookstall at the end. Can uh, I give you examples? So, yeah. Suffering. Where would someone go for suffering? Yeah, so there's a brilliant book called Confronting Christianity that's uh, got chapters on 12 of the hardest questions people ask about Christianity. One of those is on the question of suffering, so I'd recommend having a look at that. Something about believing miracles? Yes. Uh, there's a brilliant book by that professor, John Lennox, who's a professor of maths and the philosophy of science at Oxford, called Can Science Explain Everything? I think that would be a pretty good start for exploring the question of whether sort of science has disproved miracles, or whether actually it's not as simple as that. Yeah, and that would highlight why God doesn't do miracles today in the same way. Things about like the medical and other historical sources outside the Bible, where could people read about that? Uh, so you could probably find stuff in Can We Trust the Gospels? The other thing is if, if you have specific questions about bits of the evidence and stuff historically, uh, feel free to grab me at the end. And the other thing is that um, we can continue these conversations you know, now, but also um, you've got flyers on your table for Think Tank, uh, which is a thing we're running uh, for eight Monday nights next term, where basically we've got so much space uh, and time for anybody who wants to, to come discuss these big questions of life, big questions of faith, uh, in the Cambridge brew house down the road over a drink and some snack and, uh, snacks and a free dessert your first time. So I'd really encourage you to come back and drag people around you back to that with you uh, if you've got more questions that we don't end up getting to answer tonight.